Kunkel here. Make sure that you subscribe to my channel and set the notification bell to all so that you won't miss any of my new content. On this episode of Global Topic, we're going to be talking about protective coatings, failure analysis, and investigation. Joining me for this episode is Sarah Olaf from GPI Laboratories. Sarah, welcome. Hey, Jim. Could you go through and explain your role and what GPI Laboratories does? Sure. I'm uh, the manager of GPI Laboratories, so I'm involved in uh, overseeing all the day-to-day -day operations here at the lab. Uh, GPI Laboratories is a division of Greenman Peterson Incorporated. We're a multidiscipline civil engineering firm with a strong focus on transportation infrastructure. So we deal with everything from design, construction management, construction inspection. So we have a really strong uh, protective coatings focus in our uh, company. We have about 100 different professionals uh, working in various aspects of corrosion protection, mainly through protective coatings. So we have uh, our QP5 certification for our inspection firm. And then we have professionals ranging from protective coating specialists, coatings inspectors, uh, instructors for the various courses, and then of course the scientists here in the laboratory. So, Sarah, first question I would have for you, you know, when you're looking at the, the protective coatings um, uh, analysis and failure, you know, reporting uh, laboratory work, you know, typically who is requesting this type of service from GPI laboratories? Yeah, so our customers for failure analysis really range uh, the gamut of people involved in uh, corrosion protection and coating. So a lot of them are going to be the owners of the structures, be it a DOT or a railroad, um, or also um, painting contractors often will look to a laboratory for some support, particularly when there's been uh, a formal dispute. Um, paint manufacturers uh, will sometimes come to a third-party laboratory for uh, failure investigation, again, typically when it's needed for um, support of a legal dispute. And then, you know, various consulting firms will, will use the laboratory for failure analysis. There's, there's a lot of professionals out there who don't have their own laboratory available. So we provide that service for, for many different consultants as well. So typically, what type of uh, tests uh, or analysis are done in a laboratory setting related to protective coatings? Yeah, so that, you know, at the beginning of a failure analysis, the laboratory has typically collected some background information from our customer, um, hopefully some pretty complete project information and a background on what samples they've sent to us for testing. And then, you know, we'll start out just with a visual examination of the coding uh, sample, just kind of looking at what we've got, how it matches up with the background that we were given. Um, then the first tool that we'll typically go to is just a microscope. So we'll use a stereo microscope, and look at the samples anywhere from, you know, 40 times magnification up to 200 times magnification, just looking for anomalies and, you know, anything that um, is unusual or, you know, confirmation that it matches up with the background or confirmation that it doesn't. Uh, then the next tool that we typically will go to is our infrared spectrometer, so an FTIR. Uh, what an FTIR does, um, it's an analytical equipment that um, looks at the vibration of molecules. Uh, molecules in any, uh, anything around us vi vibrate all the time and at a specific frequency. And so what an FTIR does is basically it measures um, what frequencies things are vibrating in a sample. And it gives off a fingerprint. So different types of coatings give off different uh, fingerprints. So we can identify the generic resin type. We can sometimes identify pigments. Uh, depending on the type of coating, we may be able to identify the degree of cure. We may be able to identify um, the mix ratio. Uh, we can often see contamination. Uh, we'll take an uh, FTIR scan of the front side of the paint ship and the back side of the paint ship. We'll look for differences. 
Um, so there's a lot that we can learn from FTIR analysis. So, you know, that's a really powerful tool that we use in the laboratory. Um, another tool that we use uh, to identify organic uh, constituents in the sample is uh, gas chromatography. So gas chromatography is essentially a programmable oven with a special column inside. And different organic compounds will release from that column at different times and um, related to the temperatures programmed in that uh, oven. So we'll use um, kind of standard GC, which is uses a, a thermal detector, um, either flame ionization or thermal conductivity detector, or we can use a GCMS. Um, and what a GCMS is, is just that same GC oven with a mass spectrometer attached to it as the detector. So a mass spectrometer will give you a little better sensitivity, a little lower detection limits, but it also adds uh, a fingerprint of the mass spectra in that sample. So you can get a little more confident determination of what you're looking at when it's completely unknown. So we use a GC or a GCMS to um, detect and identify different types of solvents or other organic materials in the in the sample. Um, it's typically uh, used to look for retained solvents in a dry chip or to look for contamination in, say, a blister liquid when you have a condition where you've had osmotic blistering. You can look for um, water-soluble contaminants in that blister liquid using GC or GCMS. Another powerful laboratory tool is um, scanning electron microscope um, with an EDS detector. So a scanning electron microscope just gives you a lot higher power magnification. It uses um, a different imaging uh, than just a standard uh, bifocal microscope. Um, and it allows you to get magnifications in the thousand times as opposed to, you know, we're looking at 200 times with a standard microscope. Um, it also it can be very powerful when combined with the EDS. Um, the EDS will give you um, a chance to uh, analyze the x-rays that are emitted from the sample and determine what elements are on the surface of that sample. So in combination with that high power magnification and the elemental analysis, you can positively identify embedded debris and anomalies and contamination on the back side of a paint chip or embedded within the paint chip. Particularly, this is good for inorganic contaminants. Now, you're not going to see organic materials using the SEM EDS, but if you're trying to determine if a particle stuck in the back side of a paint chip is corrosion product or if it's you know, some other type of debris, you can positively identify that using SEM. And then the last tool that we use commonly here is a differential scanning calorimeter. Um, what DSC gives you, um, it, it's essentially a programmable furnace, and it will detect uh, heat flow events. So, you know, the kind of heat flow events that are interesting are, say, the melting point or the glass transition temperature. So the glass transition temperature can be used to determine the degree of cure in a coating. And also with the DSC, sometimes you'll see um, exotherms. Um, so what happens there is heat is given off as unreacted product is, is reacting in the test. So it'll give you an idea if the paint was fully cured or was not fully cured in field chips. Now, with a lot of these techniques like the GCMS, um, the GC, and the DSC, it's very helpful to have a control uh, sample. So... Um, that's some of the limitations to some of the sensitive equipment. It'll, it'll tell you what's there, but sometimes you need a control to know what you're looking for. So that kind of covers the, the, the main solid tools for, for failure analysis that we use here at uh, GPI Lab. Wow, there, there's a lot that's brought to bear when it comes to the analysis and, and, and the uh, failure investigation. Um, with GPI laboratories, you know, you're providing these very intense and thorough 
uh, and, and comprehensive uh, test analysis and, and some investigative information. Um, typically, are you called upon to testify in some cases? Um, the laboratory staff will rarely testify. Um, we do have a gentleman who has many years of experience in the industry um, who does uh, testify. Uh, he's close to retirement now. And uh, some of our uh, GPI protective coding specialists also will, will do um, expert testimony based on our laboratory testing. But um, as far as the lab staff, we typically do our work and provide um, as thorough of documentation as we can and, and try to stay out of the courtroom. <laughs> you know, you figure in, in today's uh, society or today's world, um, a lot of litigation goes on out there. So I can imagine in, with protective coatings, especially when you have, you know, near 80% of failures typically, you know, tied to surface preparation and other type of conditions. Um, in, in past episodes, you know, we talked about, you know, with different other um, people about surface prep and then also with, you know, different uh, ambient environmental conditions and things like that. You know, what are typically, based on your experience in doing analysis and testing, what, based on your experience, what type of failures are you finding out there when it comes to, is it mostly surface prep or is there other failures you're finding? Uh, there are other types of failures, but I would say surface preparation is some of the most common failures that we see. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of instances where we'll see evidence that there wasn't a proper uh, profile. So in the laboratory with just a dry chip, it may jump to mind, how do they know if the profile was sufficient in the lab? And uh, often when you have uh, delamination due to, um, you know, an improper surface profile, you'll be able to see that imprint of the profile very clearly on the back side of the paint chip. So we can often see it very, very clearly in the laboratory. And some of the places that I see it most frequently are around wells. You'll, mm. you'll see a, a real problem with the uh, surface preparation not being adequate and um, some of that delamination happening. And it, it's pretty clear just from the imprint of that profile on the back of the chip. Some of the other things that we see in the laboratory that relate to the surface preparation, um, it's it's common to see uh, debris in the in the paint chips, so um, you'll you'll see you know embedded um, abrasive on some of the very worst cases that are obvious. You know you don't really need a microscope to to see that, but um, you know some of that dust that that's harder to see with a naked eye, we can see pretty clearly under the microscope, um, uh, and then some other types of contamination. And then also when we, when we cut a cross section, um, when you, especially if the substrate is available, you know, often in the laboratory, we're just getting paint chips and we're not getting a piece of the structure. But when we can get a piece where the substrate is available, we're able to cut a cross section. And then you can see um, both the, the peaks and valleys of the surface profile that's there, as well as any, type of contamination in a nice little cross section. Um, so that's some of the most common things that we see as far as surface preparation, you know, kind of embedded, real fine, hard to see dust. So obviously you're looking at, you know, obviously uh, the in coding uh, analysis and investigation. Uh, related to your laboratory services, you, do you guys do uh, anything related to uh, testings of coatings, you know, where maybe you have a, a small producer of, of coatings, do you do any type of, a, I guess it would be non-endorsement, like accreditation or testing type of thing um, for them to be able to release their products? Sure. We, well, we do a lot of pre-qualification testing. I think that's, that's kind of what you're referring to, where we're testing to uh, a 
some type of a specification. So SSPC has a lot of different paint standards and there's other producers of specifications. And it, that is a very common service that we provide. Um, more common for us actually than the failure analysis is that uh, specification testing. So some of those tests that are that are common and, and very useful are um, things like a cyclic weathering where they'll replicate kind of try to get it close to an outdoor kind of generic outdoor environment obviously outdoors everywhere is is different so cyclic weathering combines uv uh, condensation cycles um, with a salt spray um, environment so it'll go for a week in cyclic um, UV, where it's getting a kind of day-night simulation of condensation and then UV exposure. And then it spends a week in the uh, cyclic salt spray cabinet, where it's getting uh, a fine mist of, of salt spray for an hour and then dry heat for an hour. And it'll go through, you know, a number of cycles, and then most specifications will have um, an extent of corrosion at, at the scribe that's allowable. So um, these panels that go in accelerated weathering typically have a defect cut in them. And then we look at how much corrosion of that steel substrate happens at the defect. So cyclic weathering is a common one. Salt fog, just straight salt fog is a common one. Um, cyclic uh, UV is another uh, common test, depending on the... Um, on the corrosion environment that the surface life of the paint is going to be exposed to. So there's other tests like cathodic disbondment for cathodically protected structures. There's various types of immersion. Um, there's for tank linings, there's an atlas cell test where you have a um, cold wall effect with combined with immersion. So the backside of your steel is exposed to ambient conditions where the front side of the steel has heated chemicals um, and those atlas cells can be filled with you know whatever type of chemical is going to be in the uh, storage tank we've tested things from orange juice to crude oil to uh, various types of acids so it's a it's a powerful test and and that's um you know this pre-qualification uh Weathering tests are important to give owners a good idea of what kind of service um, different coatings can withstand. And a lot of the smaller manufacturers, as you mentioned, don't have the resources in-house to perform all of these tests. And then some of the bigger manufacturers need a third party to analyze um, so that they have a little more credibility behind their results. Well, Sarah, so, we, we've covered so much. For everyone watching the episode, I will have a, a link uh, to uh, GPI Laboratories information. Um, Sarah, I think you and I could probably spend a whole day, uh, eight yeah. hours plus of video, talking about the different type of analysis and investigation and testing methods and things like that. So in, in closing out this, um, our conversation, is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to um, get to the viewers of this episode? Well, as you mentioned, there are so many topics related to to testing that we could cover. Maybe we can uh, do some follow ups. But I guess the the thing that I want to point out to everybody is, you know, hopefully, uh, if uh, proper care is taken on a project and proper selection takes place, you don't have to worry about any failure. But in the event that that you do come upon a failure, sometimes it, it's hard to um, piece back what has happened. So I can't stress enough how important um, good record keeping and good retention of retains is just to cover yourself because you never know when you're going to encounter a problem and having those, um, those things in place um, will make uh, the analysis and investigation much smoother and hopefully um, protect your interest in the project. Yes, documentation is very critical, and <laughs> photographic evidence, too. That's also sure. very critical as well. Exactly. Uh, Sarah, I will um, make sure, too, that I have a, an email address um, so people can uh, inquire related to GPI laboratories. Uh, Sarah, right. thank, thank you so much for, having, uh, for taking the time to talk with me today. Very much appreciate it. 
Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too. Take care. 